he does it so i look at him sometimes i'm like are you in my head right now bro he will he he will say things sometimes i'm like that's what i said that's what i said and like we'll sit there and i'm like that's what i said girl that's what i said and it feels really cool so yeah i don't have to mask around him girl i'm telling you right now i'll mask for the bag but i won't mask for a marriage I will mask for the bag. I will not mask for a marriage. And I think a lot of people are asking to be to mask for their marriages, whatever that means, right? So to preface this, these three TikToks, basically it's women having the conversation around like healthy and unhealthy relationships and then settling. And since we talk about settling a lot on this channel, I thought we could talk about that today. I want to talk about why settling, in my opinion, isn't the ideal choice for Brittany, but could be the ideal choice for you. So I do believe in a form of healthy settling in a relationship. And then I have an opinion on unhealthy settling, which is what I think most people engage with. So if we know the history of marriage and cohabitation, we know love marriages and consent of both parties involved is a new phenomenon. And it certainly isn't even global at this point. I think we forget that because we're so used to our Tinder apps and OkCupid and being independent in some places around the world that we forget that this idea of even engaging in um, consensual relationships or consensual love or love-focused marriages is sort of a newer phenomenon. Here is your wake-up call. Someone who ruined your mental health or even negatively impacted it is not the love of your life. Somebody who impacted your mental health, okay, in a negative way, is not the love of your life. So automatically, very strong statement. She's coming out the gate. I agree with this. I would love to know if you disagree with this, but I also think there's a lot of nuance involved in this. So from my perspective, my philosophy on love is that there is a group of X amount of people, let's say millions of people that are high compatibility partners with you. They fit the expectation of your values and you guys have the same intimacy goals or values, right? So there's like va-va-voom is good and the resume is good, okay? And that creates like a high compatibility partner, which feels so magical. It feels like a soulmate. And maybe you can call it a soulmate. I don't mind what word you use. But for me, it feels like the chances of meeting those people on the planet take a lot of luck, but it's obviously possible. And then I would say outside of that, most people are engaging in what I call settling relationships. And they can either do it in a healthy way or an unhealthy way. And usually people who engage in settling relationships, meaning not high compatibility partnerships, let's say they're compatible 70% um, or less, are gonna run into many more problems because they're not on the same page. They have a lot of gaps to fill and they don't see each other as clearly as somebody with more compatibility. So there's a lot of settling. There's a lot of feeling of like, this isn't exactly what I want or need, but it's better than nothing. And, or I wish this person would change to be with me. I wish I could just get this person to see it from my perspective. I wish this person would change who they are so our relationship was better for me, something like that. So I would say that in an unhealthy setting, a partnership that is low compatibility plus settling plus wishing your partner would change often leads to fighting, yelling, disagreements, spending money differently, raising children differently, which causes a lot of conflict, which then contributes to the divorce statistics that we're dealing with in the, the current time, right? So when I hear her say that, that's what I'm assuming she's trying to express is that if the person is the love of your life, they're going to prioritize you and them as the team. And they're not going to be focused on marriage as like this selfish thing. We're also using the word marriage interchangeably with long-term partnership because I validate and think it is valuable to have long-term partnership without the certification of marriage. We're just using marriage as a shorthand. Shout out to Siobhan for joining memberships. I appreciate you. Okay. So when I think about this, I would say that this coincides with my belief about settling, but how do you know you're settling? And again, we've talked about this time and time again, but I think that the next video kind of explains it a little bit better. And knowing you're settling is, diff is difficult because this is, okay, this is, you've heard me say this a thousand times. Don't talk about your relationship with other people. Except if you're not sure. If you're sure this is the love of your life in an incredibly profound way, like high compatibility partner, then don't talk to people about your relationship. If you're dating somebody and you're low compatibility and things are rough and you're having a hard time, you got to talk to people about your relationship so they can tell you that's a red flag. I remember I had a girlfriend of mine 
who was in like a pretty long-term relationship and we all thought it was going pretty fine. And after they broke up, which was a complete shock to all of us, like we didn't see it coming. I mean, I think even to her, it was kind of a shock. She started to tell us about the relationship and all of us were like, oh, oh my God, why didn't you tell us about your relationship? And she goes, well, I thought we're not supposed to talk about our relationships. I was like, okay, but you're not supposed to talk about your relationship with people when it's a healthy relationship because it's no one's business. But if it's an unhealthy relationship and you're feeling completely neglected and abused in the relationship, you've got to talk to somebody about that. A therapist, a holy person, whatever your religion is, or a friend, you know, so when your relationship is unhealthy, reach out. When your relationship is healthy, but you're just having like, I don't know, um, uh, personal things, intimacy problems, maybe the sex isn't as good, but like you love each other, it's not a big deal. Talk to a professional. You know, don't talk to your friends about your Gen the genitals of your spouse, right? It feels a little like crude in my opinion, in my opinion. So check out this video that I thought was kind of interesting. Normalize posting why you broke up on the internet. No, I really agree with her because when I broke up with my long-term boyfriend and I explained that I felt like I was settling and I started to talk about what that meant for me to my friends, I realized no one had ever articulated to me, this is what it looks like when you're settling. I had heard my whole life, don't settle, you deserve the best. And it, I, I had no idea what that meant, what that looked like. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely knew that the relationship I had did not look like my parents' relationship and they have a great healthy relationship. They communicate well, but I didn't know, like if someone had to put a pinpoint on it, this means you're settling. I didn't see any of that. I had no idea. But as soon as I'm single and I'm talking to talking about it to my older friends, to my divorced friends, like some divorced moms in the neighborhood, they were like, Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about it. Number one, you fight all the time. When people would say to me, Oh, we barely ever fight. Like, I don't remember the last time we argued. I thought they were lying. What do I tell you? What do I tell you? When I tell people like, I don't fight with my partner. My parents never fought growing up and people are like, that's a lie. That's a cope. You're lying. I've never seen my parents fight. I've never seen my parents turn on each other ever in 30 plus years of marriage. And some kid is always living with my parents. My parents have almost never had an empty nest because they have 10 kids, right? So someone's always at home with my parents. My parents work together. Like I don't see my parents turn on each other. They usually turn towards the problem, right? And so when I heard this, I was like, yeah. Yeah, like don't fight you with your partner. Like that's the love of your life. You're doing life with them. They're your teammate. Don't don't fight with your teammate, right? Disagreeing um is different cuz you're open, you're curious. Like if we disagree on something, it's like tell me more about that. Let's explore that. Like you're excited is different than like who did I marry? Feeling like untrustworthy, looking at your partner like they're an alien. Have you ever heard about those marriages that are 20 years long and then you look at your partner and it's like, who is this person that I married? You know, if you're going to lose touch with the person you're doing life with, like you're not on the same team, right? So when people say, and they've asked me before, are you worried that your healthy relationship is going to like lose its spark? I think that's trauma-based. Data shows, like I've seen so many psychologists talk about this, that traumatized children look for this spark in relationships and pick fights with their partners to recreate the environment they were raised in as a way to feel loved because the attention is now on them. I remember when I was in my toxic relationships in my 20s, I'd be fighting with my partner and I'd be like, this isn't normal. I've never seen my parents do this. Why are we fighting? And he would say, this is normal. People fight all the time. And I'm like, this is not, this isn't how I was raised. I was like, we're that like trashy couple. We're the trashy couple that's yelling at 3 a.m. in the morning in the apartment building. We're trash. Like, this is trashy behavior. And he was like, it's normal. And I was like, I don't want this to be my normal. I wasn't raised like this. And I asked myself, how did I get to such a place where I was allowing a man to yell at me or I was, I was yelling at my partner? Where did I come to this place in my life, right? Well, I was unhealthy. I was like suffering. So I got therapy dumped that boyfriend, moved on with my life eventually. It was messy on again, off again. Oof, let me tell you. Moved on from that. Okay. And officially ended up, you know, where I am now, which is like happily married in the right relationship. But I realized that for me, when I said like, I don't fight, like I've never seen my parents fight. This was the truth. So when people doubt it, it's like this girl, it's, it's weird to think like you guys never fight. My partner and I do not fight. 
we've been together now a year, basically. Well, we've been together a year, but like marriage almost a year now, officially. Okay. August is going to be our one year anniversary for marriage. Let's, let's say that. My, like my parents, my siblings are used to me complaining about my partners within a year. I'm usually like complaining. This isn't right. I don't feel good about this. Something's wrong. The fact that we've been together basically like almost two years and I haven't said one bad thing about my partner is such a relief to my family because they're like, okay, she's chilling. Because I was three years single and you can understand from a family that's used to you having like bad partnerships, they're waiting to see if you've like outgrown that part of yourself. And it's a relief to myself and to them that I didn't repeat a pattern, you know? And I think that's what being un- being like healthy versus unhealthy is. Being healthy is breaking the pattern. And I broke that pattern. Now I broke it before I met him, which was key because I knew I need I knew I had done it, but I didn't have the the proof because I hadn't been in a relationship, but I'd gone on lots of dates. And so when I finally like chose this person and he chose me and we created this union together, it was so clear that I had broken that pattern of choosing the wrong partners, which was really cool. But more than that, I told myself I wasn't going to settle and I didn't. And I think that was what was key for me personally, okay? So I'm not sure how it's going to work for other people. Now, that's the unhealthy side. I think there's a healthy side to settling. We'll get to that in a moment. But right now, I want to talk about the unhealthy part of settling, which is settling feels like everybody fights, right? Yeah, I feel alone in my relationship, but that's normal, right? Uh, Yeah, like sometimes he makes me feel like less about myself or sometimes she belittles me or sometimes she tells her friends stuff about me that I really wish she wouldn't say to her friends. But, you know, it's like her right to tell people about our relationship, I guess. Settling is feeling like your partner and you, in my opinion, aren't a team. It feels like you guys are living two separate lives and you almost have to respect them as being a different person, but at the same time, at the expense of yourself. So in my mind, settling is not going to be good if you do it in an unhealthy way. Again, we'll get to the healthy version of settling, but we're not there yet. I thought you fought in every relationship. I thought that was normal. It's not. When you are compatible with someone, you will barely ever fight. And when you disagree over something with someone that you're compatible with, it's a totally different type of disagreement because there's no resentment anywhere. Yep. Like you truly are doing your best to see where that other person is coming from. You're not already annoyed at him because he has nagged you and picked at you and there's no underlying resentment. Seriously, you don't argue. That's so key here. That is so key for me. If my partner and I are having a disagreement on something, like usually it's something, uh, it's something like, it's not a big deal, right? We don't really have disagreements on a lot, but let's say it's something like, um, what kind of dishware should we buy? (laughs) It's going to be something like that, right? Like what kind of dishware should we buy? We'll have a disagreement and we'll explain why you want that kind of cutting board. Cause I don't get it. Why are we getting that kind of cutting board? It's like, I'm interested. I want to know. Or like, even if we're having a disagreement, I'm trying to think of something that would be a little bit more intense than a cutting board. But let's say we had that kind of agreement or disagreement. We would be, we wouldn't be thinking like, who did I marry? We wouldn't be thinking like, oh my God, I should break up. We wouldn't be thinking, we'd be thinking, tell me more about that. Teach me about the person I'm going to spend my life with, right? Hold on. Let me catch up on chat really fast. Aurora says, I grew up with parents yelling at each other often. And I have always thought I would never want that. It feels wrong. Yeah. It must feel really like, familiar in some ways, but then also like kind of painful. And again, I don't know about you, but when I read romance stories, you know, growing up, they didn't involve yelling or cheating or hitting their partners, you know? Halo who? Halo who? I don't know how to say your name. I'm so sorry. Brittany, I have followed your courtship advice a little over a year ago. Now I'm about to close the gap and move to the UK in two weeks to be with my fiance. Congratulations. Have the best, smoothest wedding ever. Lysandra says healthy version of settling sounds like a cope right now. So I'm looking forward to, to this knowing it'll be It will be a never for me, healthy version of settling. I've got a version of, I've really thought about what is a healthy version of settling. So I'm gonna, we'll get there. I've really thought about this guys because we talk about settling a lot. Chrissy says, your earrings are so pretty, Britt. I'm behind, but I'm so excited to break the pattern of toxic relationships myself. Even if I end up settling, I'm deaf, don't want the, the fighting in my life anymore. Amen, amen, and thank you so much. It was like, they're very space themed. I haven't worn them in a while, so I was like, let's do this. Colleen says, when my husband and I disagree, it leads to a lot of questions, not fighting. Yeah, curiosity, questions, examination, exploration. Oh, I get so excited, you know? Kesha says, people tell me my fans, tell 
me and my fiance all the time, we don't have a real relationship because we never argue or fight and are healthy. Watch out for that. I'm serious. People will tell you, you know, oh, like this is my, you know, your relationship. Like, have you guys even had a relationship if you haven't fought? And I'm like, have no intimacy grows by going through hardships together and seeing how you react. Like, I'm going to be real with you. My partner and I going through my my diagnosis process together, my partner and I going through immigration together. That was stressful. And not only did we not fight, but we always tried to comfort each other through the stress. So I feel like relationships test themselves by how stressful the environment is and then how you two handle it. My mom gave me that advice. My mom and dad told me that the real test in a relationship is not how you fight. It's how you fight the world. Don't fight each other. Fight the world. And I feel like my partner and I had two really big tests in our relationship. Right away, I was sick. So we had to work with that. And two, we had to deal with immigration and we just, we were so stressed and yet all we did was comfort each other. We were there, we listened. And even when we were like getting overstimulated, we never like took it out on each other, you know? And I think that is such a, I I really listened to my parents when they said that. And it was true. It showed up in that way for my relationship, you know? Okay, let's keep going. Number two is I felt like my boyfriend would have changed me if he could. Um, that's not normal. He thought I wore too much pink. He wanted me to wear more black clothing. He didn't like my personality in the car on the way to an event. He would say, don't talk about this. Don't talk too much on the way home from an event. He would say all the things I did wrong. It really felt like he loved me, but he did not like me. Oof. Number three. Oof. Girl, I'm so glad she's sharing this because this is, this is real. When you're in a toxic relationship, you will have moments like this and you'll be like, who am I dating? What am I doing with my life? Why do I feel bad? Why do I want to avoid my partner? I've been there. My 20s was crazy, bros. Like, I'm going to be real with you. I really hope you understand that out of all the people in the world that could never judge you for being in a toxic relationship, it's me because I've been there. And I was toxic enough to be in those relationships. I really hold a lot of responsibility in picking those partners and also not recognizing in so many ways that like when I'm like, I really don't want this. Like I love isn't enough. I really think love isn't enough. You know, I really think you have to have high compatibility. And yeah, like I've had a lot of those conversations with my ex-partners where it was like, why do you talk like that? Why do you dress like that? Why do you look like that? And to be honest with you, I also felt it from my end where I would be like, this isn't how I imagined my life. Like one of the most infamous conversations I had with my ex, with his parents, I've told you this a thousand times, is his parents sat us down and they asked us, do you want the other to change? And he was like, no, I don't want Brittany to change. And I said, yes, I need you to change. You're like very unhealthy and we're very unhappy and we're fighting every day. And he was like, well, then I want you to change if you want me to change. I was like, see what you're doing? You're lying so you can sound like love is enough, but I just want you to be honest. Are you happy? And he was like, well, how much happier could we be? Isn't this what relationships are? And I'm like, no, no, they're not like this. And even his parents, they had a like a really lovely marriage. It wasn't easy in the beginning, but it's very beautiful. But he couldn't see the beauty. Now, to be fair, like there was a lot of factors that played into that. So ultimately, there was almost like this thing where we were taught growing up, which is to lie and pretend things weren't bothering you, to lie on the first date and say you're better than you are, to keep things from your partner so they don't feel like they can't rely on you. And I just went for radical honesty. So the way that I changed dating for myself as well is I went for radical honesty. On the first date, I talked about finances, um, medical history. I talked about, you know, future stuff. What do you want for kids? And yeah, it was overwhelming for some people. And some people gave me feedback and said, your first dates feel like an interview. And I said, I am. I'm interviewing for the love of my life. Are you the love of my life? And they were like, well, I don't know yet. And I was like, "Hmm, probably not then. If dating me feels exhausting because it feels like an interview, what do you think marrying me is going to be like? Like, what do you think marrying me is going to be like if you can't handle the first date? You know, and so again, my partner and I, we talk all the time. We're like, oh, oh, you know, the whole like, would you rather be in a forest with a bear or a man? Him and I explored that topic for like hours yesterday. And I was like, what if it's a baby? We're like, what if it's a baby, a woman or a bear or a man? And then we all like him and I talked for hours yesterday about this silly little TikTok trend, you know, and P.S. He understands why I wouldn't choose a man. 
he gets it. He's like, yeah, that makes sense. Why would you choose a man? I was like, exactly. Why would I choose a man? But also, why would I choose a baby? Like, if you had to be stuck in the forest with a bear or a baby, why would you choose the baby? That sounds like a lot of responsibility. So we had a lot of fun doing that. And, you know, little conversations like that, exploring ideas, understanding where your person is coming from, all of that is so important. All of that adds to the relationship, right? I couldn't imagine being with somebody who didn't want to talk to me all day. And still knows how to say, okay, I would like my own loan time. Like we both have our own offices. So we both have our own PC setups. And I'll be like, okay, I want to go spend alone time with myself. Are you good? Do you want to do anything else? And he'll be like, nope, I'm good. I'm like, okay. And then we kiss and then we go into our own offices. But we check in. We're like, what are you doing right now? You know, it's about that. It's about actually caring about what that person is going through. And then prioritizing the relationship over yourself. And then, of course, getting to prioritize yourself over other things because the relationship, then you, then other things, you know? Okay, let's keep going. Three is you need to be compatible on what you want for the future. And I definitely talk about this very early on in dating. I talked about it my first date with my current boyfriend. I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, have a bunch of kids. He grew up with a stay-at-home mom, had a bunch of kids. So in my head, I'm like, oh, sweet. I'm going to get that out of this relationship. No, oh. I was working a nine to five and doing an and doing an Etsy shop. I was probably working 10 to 12 hours a day and he barely lifted a finger. He was Ooh. like, oh, I support you. I'm going to help you. He didn't help. He mm-hmm. didn't lighten my load. Um, the man could not have run a household if he tried. She sounds like she dated some of my exes. <laughs> Same. I was working fucking 12 hour days as a nanny, another five hour shift as a YouTuber trying to make it full time. No, I've done it. Thank you. I was hustling so hard, two to three jobs, and I just couldn't get the men in my life to participate in our life. They would dream all day. I want to dream. I want this thing. And they just couldn't lift a finger to save their fucking lives. And I just didn't get it. I was like, what are you doing? And then I realized like, oh, I kept picking dreamers, people who talked a big game but couldn't fucking follow through to save their life. And I just like, I'm so glad I broke that pattern, girl. Because in his head, that was a woman's job, even though I was working more hours than him. No, I dated the progressive men that claimed they were progressive. That's why I say watch out for men who talk a big game about respecting women, will look through their actions. I dated progressive. So she dated the conservative guy. I dated the progressive guy who overpromised. Mm-hmm. She dated the conservative guy that overpromised. Nice. I get you, sis. I get it. Woo. You have to be able to live in a way that is compatible to your goals, both of you, without you having to nag him every single day or it will not work. Mm-hmm. I realized no one had ever articulated. Okay, love this video, absolutely relatable. I think she brings up all of those big points. Now, funny enough, right? I I will link the TikTok in the chat for those who want it. Um, funny enough, I, when I was dating in my toxic relationships, I would have these conversations with my partners. I would have them with friends and family. But it was hard for people to give me the wisdom that I needed. And it was hard for me to understand the wisdom of like why I kept choosing these men or these women even. And while the women are great, honestly, but the men, the men were a problem. And a big part of it was that I, I kept thinking, and this was my personal flaw as a person is I kept thinking I could date somebody in a parallel relationship I didn't realize how much I needed to be on a team with my person. I kept thinking like we're different people, but we can be different people and still date, right? No. Like for Brittany, no. Values were really, really important. I couldn't feel like I was dating a roommate. I didn't want to feel like I was dating a friend, like just a friend. I wanted to feel like I was dating my best friend, like the love of my life, my favorite teammate, my favorite person on the whole planet. And I felt like I found that now. But when I was dating in my 20s, I really made the mistake of dating these, like, as if we were two roommates doing our life together, but not as a team. And it really messed with me. So I learned for myself personally, in order to not settle, we had to be compatible intimacy-wise and compatible values-wise. And we had to work as a team. I didn't want to have separate lives. I didn't want to say, hey, what are you doing with your career? What am I doing with mine? I wanted to say as a team, whose career are we prioritizing? Whose goals are we prioritizing? What are we doing as a unit? Are we having kids? Are we not having kids? I want it to be clear. You know, I wanted it to be understood that we were on the same page. I wanted to trust them with money. I've never shared money. 
with my partners. Like I've never shared money with my partners until my husband. And then we did that. Like I was really like he he worked, you know, he moved out of his parents' house years ago. He had his own place, his own job, his own established like life when I met him, which I found attractive. You know, he was really good with money. You know, he was really responsible. And then when I got with him, that made me feel so much better combining finances and doing things together and trusting each other to like make the team win. Versus in my 20s, man, the people I dated were not good with money. They couldn't even hold down a job. And not in this, not in the same way. Like obviously I'm the breadwinner in my current marriage. Like my husband is a stay-at-home partner who helps. He does everything else. Basically I work. He does everything else. That's how I like to phrase it. He has a full-time job and it helps keep my career going because my career is the focus because I'm a career person and that's what I want to do with my life. And that's what we're dedicating our energy to because it is the best plan for the team right now and probably for the long time versus my other relationships. It was clear to me that we should have prioritized my job since I cared about my career, but my partners didn't want to do that. And they always felt threatened by my job and threatened by my career. And they felt inadequate as people because I was the breadwinner. And that always made me feel weird because I didn't think it mattered regardless of gender, like who was the breadwinner. But I needed somebody who also believed that, not somebody who just said they believed that. So when I married my now partner, it was clear to me like gender doesn't play a role in this marriage. We don't care who's the man or the woman or who's what, what. All we care about is making the team win. And that's a values difference. Gender is a values difference. If you're a conservative person who really, really needs gender to matter, so I'm the man and I do this and I'm the woman and I do this, that's fine. That's valuable. But make sure you're dating someone who really agrees with that. Because if you don't agree with that, it's going to cause conflict. That's a values thing. There's nothing wrong with making gender a focus of your relationship. There's also nothing wrong with making gender not the focus of your relationship. So for me, like we're playing the game that makes the team win. I don't care what the world says, especially a world that is like crazy divorce rates and constantly settling, right? Okay. <clears throat> 12 says, do you think you can be in a healthy relationship with someone who has different opinions or someone who has very different opinions? Opinions on which football team is the best, opinions on which anime is the best, or opinions on how to raise children. I'm not convinced you can be in a very healthy relationship with somebody who does not share your core values. And I think that's what's so scary. I saw, okay, there's this episode of Blackish that's really funny where the couple, the main couple, okay, they're having a conversation about their kids having sex. And the dad is celebrating the boy for having sex. And the mom is like, why are we celebrating our teenage son having sex? Like, what are we doing? And he goes, well, you know, he's just, you know, just getting it in, you know, da, da, da. and then the mom goes, okay, well, I guess we can celebrate our teenage daughter having sex because she's getting it in, you know? And the dad was like, what? And there was like a double standard. And it's interesting, of course, that show is like every sitcom. It shows you family dynamics in the most like simplified way, but it shows you it in the moment. I'm more of a person who talks about it prior. Like, okay, we have kids. Would we want them having sex at 13 years old? Is that a thing we want to make normal? Because lots of people lose their virginity at 13. Do we want to normalize that in our household? That's a values difference, you know? Or no, do we want to encourage our kids to not have sex till they're 18? Or what's the re what's a reasonable age for parents? Because we also want it to be sex positive and we want to make sure that our kids come to us with like contraceptive issues or, hey, like I don't want to get a girl pregnant or, hey, I don't want to get pregnant. Like I don't want, if I had kids, we're, we're choosing probably not to have kids at this point, right? Like that's, we've basically made the decision. It's not final till you get the surgery. That's why I always caveat it, but that's a values difference. So you know, the scary part is you're getting married to somebody, you think you agree on how to raise kids, and then your baby's coming and your partner has a completely different vision for children. Or what about circumcision? Like I'm I'm not very, I'm not a big fan of circumcision. I'll be real with you. I feel like it's unnecessary and I feel like you're mutilating a child and they haven't even started life yet. And that's really strange. I'm not saying you're a bad person for getting your kids circumcised. I just think it's unnecessary pain and I don't understand the point of it. And so I wouldn't get my kids circumcised and I would want somebody who agreed with that. But then what if I married somebody who wanted to get their kids circumcised? Like these are value differences. So do I think you can have a healthy relationship with very big value differences? No. With very different opinions? Well, it depends. Like are, what's the opinion about things that aren't related to values? You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? Okay. Now, 
Uh, this next video is a is a stitch to the video we just watched, and this is the video about settling that I that sparked this whole like wanting to have this conversation. Actually, yeah, mm, yeah. Let's watch that, and then we'll get into healthy settling. Okay. This is what it looks like when you're settling. Same. This is such a good articulation of like what settling actually looks like, because it's true. We hear "Don't settle. You deserve the best. Like you deserve better." Our entire lives, and nobody actually explains what that looks like. I've also been very introspective and like observant in my entire life. I've observed good and bad relationships and been like, "I want that. I don't want that." And I was kind of committed from a very young age to not getting into a relationship unless it had the qualities that I wanted. I've only been in two actual relationships. I dated around in college, but actually putting a label on it too. One of them being. My my husband. When I first met my husband, I really didn't understand what people meant when they said like, when you know, you know. And I don't think that has to be the case for everybody. But I genuinely knew within a week, and he did too. Although I knew, I'm not stupid, right? Like I know that there's a lot of milestones in your relationship that you need to get to in order to really, really know a person. One of the things that I didn't know was possible that she mentioned in that video was when you're with the right person, you do not fight. Like you genuinely do not fight. Like you might have disagreements, but you're always gonna just wanna talk it through and hear the other person's perspective because mm -hmm. you genuinely care about that person. Like you're not coming at it from a point of like discontent or hostility or anything like that. You're coming at it from like, I just really want to understand your perspective so that we can like move through this together. I've been with my husband now for almost a decade and to this day I truly cannot relate when people say like, oh, we fight all the time or I'll hear people fighting in public or wherever I'm at. We just don't fight. Like we genuinely don't. We get along and we really just like each other. Like that's the thing. Like she mentions. Yeah, I really like my partner. I really like him. And he really likes me. Like we really, really, really like each other. And the last thing we would ever do to one another is hurt each other. Like I don't usually try to hurt the people I like. But more than that, the number one person I'm going to go out of my way to not hurt is my partner, the love of my life. Now, to be fair, I do think when you really, 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 really understand someone and you really, really see them, you are less likely to hurt them. You know what I mean? Like sometimes I'll have, uh, I'll have people, you know, they'll, people are always talking about their relationships, right? And some people will talk about their relationships and talk about how like they're on again and off again. There's a lot of like, oh, I don't trust this person. Like, oh, he liked an Instagram photo or, oh, my partner cheated on me, but they were really going through something. And I've, you know, I've had people in my life and it's very confusing whether you're like friends or family or coworkers, the amount of coworkers that have cried to me about their relationships. He cheated again. I don't know what to do. He cheated again. And I'm like, girl, and I get it. I've been cheated on and I tried to make that work. And, you know, we tried to do everything we could and it just, it, it doesn't work. It's not, the love of your life doesn't cheat on you. The love of your life doesn't abuse you. The love of your life doesn't do these things. Now, I think people think because they were traumatized and there's so much like I really I, we have to watch a whole video series on the data about uh, abuse cycles, you know, and that's more mental health. Maybe I can get Dr. Kirkonda on. And we can talk about it. But, you know, growing up expecting a certain kind of love will allow you to tolerate bad behavior and partners as like a but look how wonderful our relationship is that it made it through all of these horrible times. Yeah, that's a theory you can have, but I think it's unhealthy settling. I think it's it's like a codependency, like an illusion of romance. You're looking at this person that's hurt you so much and you're thinking, but look at all the ways they've also made my life beautiful. And that's a choice you can make, but that's not what I'm doing with my partner. And not to compare our relationships, but I would argue if you're asking me, only if you're asking me, that I think we are a example of high compatibility partners who are in a healthy situation and are working as a team. That's our category of relationship dynamics. So that's why cheating to us is abusive. It's why hitting each other is abusive. It's why lying to each other is abusive because in our minds, we're working at complete honesty and transparency and we're working on a relationship that we've consented to, which is to work as a team. And so that like if you betray that trust and you rock the foundation of this marriage, like I don't know how we would be able to rebuild that. And we probably won't, which is what the Gottmans were saying when we watched them a few weeks back. It is very hard to rebuild a relationship on shaky foundation when the trust has been broken. And that would be devastating to me if we've worked this hard to make this relationship so beautiful. 
only for one of us to be so dumb? Like, how could we ever do that to one another without it being so targeted and malicious? And then at that point, don't stay with that person, Habibi. Don't stay with a person that's willing to cheat on you and lie to you. But also, I think if you have certain levels of dysfunction, they are more likely to cohabitate and then codependent like date. And so they are more likely to end up together and kind of justify it. Have you ever seen those relationships where it's like, he left me for the he left me for a girl he was sleeping with, like he was cheating on me. And then the girl marries that guy and goes, I got the guy. I won the prize. Or maybe it's reverse gender roles. And then they get divorced. They've done studies that if you cheat, the next partner you're going to be with, you're probably going to cheat on them to some extent. Or there's variations of like kind of cognitive dissonance, lying to yourself and telling yourself certain things. Now, this isn't to say that you can't make your toxic relationship healthy. Obviously, I don't know how to do that. I've, you know, that's a therapy thing. That's a counseling thing. But I would say that ultimately, if you're starting from scratch and you notice you're being mistreated, you know what I mean? You maybe want to change course. And this comes down to like, do you even like your partner? You know how many people I read about who are like, I just don't like my partner. I'm like, you don't like them? Like, you don't like their partner. That's devastating to me. You know, that's, you know, okay, let's keep going. Sat in the video too. You know when someone doesn't like you. Like, they might love you, but you know when they don't like you. Mm -hmm. You should never be questioning that in a relationship with anybody, really. And then the moving in thing. Like, we didn't move in together until, like, six years into our relationship. And I heard from everybody, like, oh, like, you really know. Like, when you move in together, like, that's when you'll know because everybody's true colors shine. Like, that's when you get in the most fights. That's when things get really hard. And I kid you not, from day one until now, it has been the most fun experience of my life. If you're with the right person, I genuinely believe it's like having a sleepover with your best friend like every single day. We just laugh. We have fun together. We Same. It feels like the best thing ever. You know what I mean? Like the best thing ever. It's so fun. It feels like a girl sleepover every day. And I'm loving it. Like it literally, <laughs> it's so great. Like I'm not going to lie. It's so fun. But we like each other a lot. Like we really like each other, which I think is kind of the point. We accomplish and tackle things together, which is like amazing because I was used to doing it always just as a singular unit. Um, and it's just fun. Like I just have so much fun. And I do think that it's really important. Like if you're questioning things and if you're not having fun living with this person, just being around this person like quite a bit throughout your week, that's probably a big sign that you might be settling. I don't think it's the case for everyone, but I do think it's the case for a lot of people that say marriage is hard, that they're not with the right person. Marriage isn't hard, life is hard. Marriage is not hard. It's the easiest, best thing you'll ever do, but it is, life is hard. And so that's when the marriage is tested, when life is tested. You know, when you don't, like I remember my mom tells this story. She had, I think she had seven kids at the time. And they were, my dad was starting his business and it was like getting off the ground or maybe he was just about to start his business. No, he had started, he must have already started the business at the time. I can't remember. The details are fuzzy, but for some reason we were staying with my grandparents. I don't remember why, but we were temporarily staying with our grandparents in between like rentals. I don't remember why, but it was fun. And I remember liking the experience. Um, Though that's my mom's side. So my grandma, God rest her soul, was in the hospital because she had Alzheimer's and my grandpa was there. Anyways, when we were there, I remember the whole house flooded. And my mom tells this story with so much laughter. She goes, oh my gosh, we were so stressed. She goes, we had no money. I was staying with my dad. You know, everything was so stressed. We were all sleeping in one bed together. We were having all of these problems like life was, not us in the marriage. But all I remember is laughing so much with your father. I just remember laughing and making it a game with the kids and all of these things. You know what I mean? And so I think there's something about that where they talk about the most stressful time in their life and they talk about how much there was like laughter minus the time they had to deal with, deal with me as a teenager. That was less laughter, <laughs> less laughter. But like when we were kids and life was kind of hard, they found a way. I remember in the 2008 crash, the 2007 to the 2008 crash, my dad was out of work for like three years. It was insane. But the kids never really felt it. Like as children living at home, I was just graduating high school. We didn't really know what was happening because my parents never made it our problem. But we, I just remember those years being pretty funny. Like we were all just hanging out and watching a lot of Disney movies and just like I was struggling with myself and I was fighting my own existential dread. So that was really stressful. And my, everybody was in their teen years. My parents had like 
seven teenagers at home at almost all times. So it was kind of stressful. But I don't remember my parents ever fighting. I don't remember them ever risking their marriage. I don't remember talks of divorce. I don't remember anything. You know what I mean? So I don't know. It's just one of those things where I, I'm lucky that I had that as an example because I know, I know not everybody gets that. And I really do know that impacts how we end up repeating cycles. Discord says the only time there has ever been conflict in my relationship is when one of us is triggered. It really happens these days and it was never what I would call a miserable experience. The trigger sucked, but not working out the conflict. I think that's because we started out as friends and we always maintained it. We love each other and ultimately we want each other to be healthy and happy. You know what's funny about that? I think if I'm going to, I think the I think I relate to that so much where I feel like because I, you know, we're in a neurodivergent marriage and we both have our own overstimulation things or like noises or smells or whatever it is. The one, the one thing that my partner and I run into is overstimulation. And obviously if either of us are feeling overwhelmed, we can get into a situation where it feels like, oh, like I, it's so much, I can't handle it. I need to like take a moment. And it's nice that we can just say that out loud and say, Hey, like I'm feeling away or I need a moment or, Hey, the stress is too much for me. I'm going to go meditate. It's like, instead of fighting with each other, it's being in such a safe space. I can say out loud, I think I need some space without it being a rejection. Instead of me running away from my partner and hiding in my office, it's me saying, is it okay if I go sit in my office so I can like decompress? And him saying, absolutely, do what you need. I love you so much. And then us being supportive of one another. I think in a lot of and a lot of communities and a lot of marriage situations, a lot of people punish their partners for getting triggered or punish their partners for uh, feeling overwhelmed or they feel like they take it personal and it's not like about you. It's about me. I'm going through something. Is that okay? And it's like, yeah, dude, I love you. Like I never think in my head, again, I don't, I'm not worried about rejection. I'm worried about consent. I'm not worried about rejection. I'm worried about violating my partner's consent. So if he tells me, hey, I need like a moment to like decompress, my job is to say, okay, I love you. Like we sometimes have mornings together and sometimes we don't. Depending on when we wake up, I'm like, do you want to spend the morning with me or do you want to meet up later today? And usually it's dependent on who wakes up first, how we feel. Sometimes we have our coffees together. Sometimes we don't. It's this idea of instead of we, what we do is like we literally like each other and love each other so much. Everything is about making the team win. So if you need to have your coffee in your office alone, bro, based, I'll go edit. I'll go do things. I'll call my mom. I'll do, it doesn't, great. What does this have to do with me? Thank you for telling me what you need. How, you know what I mean? And same, if I was like, actually, could you have breakfast with me? I'd appreciate it. We'll negotiate. I'll have breakfast with you now, but I want two hours alone in the office. Deal. And by the way, we have open door policies. So like we walk into each other's offices all the time, like 20 times a day, more, uh, a lot more actually. We walk into each other's office. We're always like knock, knock. And I'm like, we're always walking. Cause again, it's not about alienating. It's not about rejecting. It's about, yes, thank you, Diana, respecting each other's boundaries, an insane amount of respect for each other's boundaries, you know? And then of course we, we try to make each other's day better. So, you know, Maybe I'll notice like, oh, you know, we haven't eaten in a bit. I'll make food. Or maybe he'll notice, ah, she hasn't eaten in a bit. We'll make food. Like we think about each other. Ah, I don't know if I've had enough water today. I should go ask him if he had enough water today. You know, stuff like that. It's like, mm, I don't know if we had enough like food because both of us have time space stuff. So like we just forget, you know. Yes, Hannah says we have a safe word for when we are getting overstimulated and need some grace. Same. Same. We have a uh, safe word, like we're like yellow, overstimulated, yellow, I'm really hungry. Can we please stop this conversation so I can like eat or yellow, I really need to pee. Can like I pee really fast and then you can finish that thought or, you know, stuff like that or yellow, I really need to say this before I forget it. Can I say it really fast? Everything. It's like just saying, it's like saying, I respect you. I'm not meaning to interrupt you, but hey, I need to like, I need to tell you what's going on. It's really great. SB says he's never walked in on your stream though. Not yet. Hopefully he doesn't because he will be on camera if he did, you know. 
Uh, B says people who get triggered by other people being triggered are unfortunately really hard to be around. Now, the good news is that if you noticed yourself getting triggered by someone else's trigger, that's a good indication that you can work on something yourself. And that way you guys can end up creating like a cohesive sort of environment. I also have a theory that your triggers have to be complementary to each other to an extent, like your bad has to be complementary to their bad. Meaning like if you're still working on something, it has to be something that doesn't end up becoming like triggering to your partner, which can be difficult. And I think you can work through that. But the good, like the place you want to be in in a healthy relationship is one where their triggers don't trigger you. Even though sometimes they might get overstimulated and need some space, it would it would be better if that wasn't happening, obviously, because you don't want to create a cycle of like perpetual triggering, right? And I'm assuming we need like medical triggering in that sense, you know? Okay, let's continue. And I think it's really important to figure that out quickly. The circumstances around my relationship have been hard, right? Like we did long distance for five years and that was extremely, extremely tough. And then there's been other things, right? Because you just go through things individually and collectively and it's families and just, you know, everything happens, life is life. But my relationship itself has never been hard. It has been the biggest joy of my life and the biggest blessing in my life. And we articulate that to each other literally every single day. And I think that's extremely important as well. And I know I've mentioned that on this page before when I've talked about my relationship, but I think that gratitude and expressing gratitude to the other person yeah. every single day yeah. is like the biggest connection point you can have. It never gets old. I 1000% couldn't agree more. 1000%. My whole family practices gratitude I've always seen my parents compliment each other and praise each other like in a, in a, like a real way, like pick something that's authentic. And, you know, I try to do that. My partner and I are always like thanking each other, like saying, I love you. We're always reminding each other, like you're doing great today and I'm not going to take it for granted. So even if I said it yesterday, today is a brand new day and I want to say it again today. And I think that's kind of key is every single day is a brand new day to show love. So it doesn't matter how much love I showed you yesterday. Today is restarting the love meter. Does that make sense? So there's this like concept in toxic relationships where it's like, um, I already kissed you yesterday. I already loved you yesterday. I already did this yesterday. Yeah, but today's today. And so my partner and I kind of like wake up every day. And maybe this is because we're neurodivergent. Maybe it's because I'm chronically ill where I do have to ask myself, what energy do I have today? What can I get done today? But like we, I look at today as a new opportunity to like kiss him a hundred times and hug him and touch him and be with him. And every day is a new reset of time. So it kind of feels like every day, I don't know, like it's just like every day is a brand new day to be in love again. It almost like resets the whole thing. I can't get tired of him because every day is like a new day to celebrate that love. You know, Chrissy says for people um, like me who grew up with toxicity, you were talking about how your parents went through hardships and they didn't fight is a bubble pop on its own. Might be another reason people think it's normal to fight. Exactly. <gasps> Thank you, Guardian Angel. Says your eyes are so in love. God bless. Thank you. I know. I know. Every time I talk to my mom, she's like, wow. And even my mother-in-law, she goes, ugh, you guys are so in love. And I'm like, I know. I know. We see our in-laws. I see my in-laws like once a month. And they're always just like, oh, it's so nice. You're so in love still. And I'm like, yeah, well, you know. Yeah, what can I say? Okay. Okay. What can I say? Old. You can never do it too much. And I think that if you're with the right person, it is the secret to a long lasting, happy, healthy relationship and marriage. Because when you feel appreciated, you feel loved. And that really is like the point of a relationship, right? To be in love. I think it's really important for younger people who are just getting into relationships or like trying to figure things out to really understand what settling means because it's not just like this abstract concept. It's like actual factual things that make up whether or not you're compatible. It's my two cents, but please watch that full video. It was really great. Love that video. And I saw it and I was like, oh, girl, I got to watch this on stream. Caitlin says, my ex saying fighting like we did is normal was such an awakening. It took so much time, but I just knew my heart. It wasn't right. I same girl. Same. I look back on Brady in her 20s and I'm like, girl, you knew this was fucked up. Why did you stay in this relationship? And listen, I stayed in those relationships because I was pre-therapy. Um. I was being introspective, but not enough, right? I wasn't asking myself why enough, you know? And I wasn't, I wasn't, 
I wasn't somebody with a consistent, like I didn't have my values really solidified and I was still trying to figure them out. Because remember, I came from religion. And so I was given a set of values and then I left religion and I was interested in philosophy and politics and introspection. And I was going on this journey where I eventually had to form my own values. And if you've gone through the atheistic journey, you know that's really, really difficult. It's, it's, I don't believe in objective morality either. So it's even more difficult, which is, which is like to say, why are these my values? And why am I asking a partner to also share them? Right? Why am I asking that of a person? Especially since they're not objective. But what they become is sort of objective to your consciousness. They become sort of true to your heart. This is something that is true to my heart. And it reflects a very healthy version of me. And I'm not saying they're objective like for other people. But for me, when I think about my values, I think about how much they feel like they represent the goodness inside of me. And so they become my values. They make me a better person. When I stick to them, I'm better to people around me. But mostly, like, I'm, I'm the best version of myself when I, when I adhere to these values that I feel like come from a deep, deep part of my consciousness. And at the same time, like, they're still not objective, right? <clears throat> Discord said, yes, that's exactly what we do. There are times where I can't handle being interrupted. So I made a do not disturb sign. I, oh, bro, when I'm like in the zone, when I'm in the zone, when I'm like in the zone, sometimes he'll walk through the door and I go, ah, did bah. no. And he'll be like, and then he walks out or I'll walk into his room. He's like, ah, did bah. and I'm like, mm. and then we, because mm. like when you're, it's such, it's about safety. It's about safety. We feel so safe with each other that when I when when I'm in the zone and he walks in, I'm like, ah, oh, because I'm I'm working on something and I'm like already at my like end of my spoons. If he adds one more thing to my plate, I'm gonna tank and I won't be able to finish my projects. You know, so I'm like, and he goes, because the last thing he wants to do is fuck with my flow. Okay. That's don't fuck with the flow. Right. And at the same time, when I'm done. I'm done. I'll run out and I'll go say, hey, I'm so sorry. What did you need? What did you need? I'm here now. Now I can give you my attention because I'm very like, I don't know if it's the fibro or what. I do think it that's the fibro has impacted a lot. But, you know, if I know I'm like focused and if I, I, I think it's also, girl, I think it's ADHD. I'm telling you, if I get derailed even for a second, I like, that's it. I can't go back to the mood. I can't go back to it. And sometimes I can power through, but why power through when I can just get, psh, let me finish it. Let me finish it. Let's go. B says, Britt, you just verbalized something I've been trying to discuss in therapy. I love you. Let's fucking go. Good. I'm glad. I'm so glad. You know? Ah, uh, Kesha says, I feel like people want validation that their toxic relationship isn't actually toxic. So they project onto healthy couples and try to bring them down 100%. 100%. Yeah, I do think that's my lived experience. I think I've had I've had so many instances where well not really, to be honest with you, it's really just like it's not that many, but it's enough. You know, enough people who have been like they'll say something like uh where they need you to like validate their relationship. Like my relationship is just as valid as yours. All relationships are just as valid. But are like when I talk about the relationship I have, I'm obviously doing something different than all these people that are settling. Obviously, my relationship is different. You know what I mean? Like, I'm obviously doing a different category of relationship. I think it's healthy. Now, there are different ways to do healthy. Okay, ready? We're going to talk about healthy settling. Okay? Because this is the problem that happens. Unhealthy, toxic couples will be like, my relationship is just as valid as your relationship. And I'm like, it is just as valid as my relationship, but it is not the same kind of relationship because yours is toxic and unhealthy. Now, a healthy relationship that is different from mine, let's say a religious relationship is just as valid as my relationship. They love their partners just as much as I love mine. They just happen to be religious. That's valid. Like a poly relationship is different than my relationship, but it's just as valid as long as it's healthy. The thing that doesn't make it, and it's all it's always valid. Oh, we're gonna get bogged down in semantics now. All relationships are valid in terms of the sense that they're happening. But whether or not they're healthy is dictated on how the partners in the relationship are being treated and the awareness that the partners have of what's happening in the relationship. So if it's polyamorous, but everyone's consenting and everything's transparent and everyone's feeling great about the relationship and everyone's bragging and in love as much as I am, it's chilling. 
But if you have a relationship where you're always complaining, your partner cheats on you, there's lying and deception, you feel like you're always doing the work for your partner or they're doing the work for you, I would say that's an unhealthy relationship you're trying to make work. And I would say it's not the same as my relationship because it's not in the category of healthy. And it's not in the same relationship category because we're not doing the same things, but it's your right to engage in that toxic relationship, right? And then let's say you have a relationship that's like settling but happy. So settling and toxic, that's one version of a relationship. Settling and healthy kind of looks like long-term best friends. I know of couples who fall into this trope where they kind of just spend life together, but they're not in love in a traditional sense. And they definitely don't feel like soulmates, but they feel very, very comfortable with one another. And I think that is a healthy way to settle. To say that we know what's happening, it's transparent, everyone's being honest, and we can have the hard conversations, I think that's a version of settling that's valid. The only reason I think healthy relationships are bad and toxic and probably shouldn't happen is because I think that they are unnecessary if your goal is to be healthy, and I think necessary if your goal is to be unhealthy. So if somebody comes to me and says, I have a very healthy relationship, and I say, didn't you guys cheat in that relationship? They're like, yeah, but like we're working on it. And I was like, don't you constantly call me complaining about your relationship? And they're like, yeah, but think about all the good times. I was like, what good times? And the good times are things that are like short-lived or superficial. Then yeah, we're not doing the same thing. I'm doing life with somebody and you're doing whatever's convenient at the time unless they want to do something else. That's not the same thing right? So it's not that I want to talk shit on other people's relationships. I just want to make it clear that that's not what I'm doing. I am not waiting around for the next best thing. My partner isn't constantly questioning if this is the relationship they want and they're sleeping with other people to check. I don't have to deal with like, I'm, that's not what's happening, right? We're doing life as a team. Now, I do think in those cohabitation situations where you're settling, but in a healthy way, You're saying, hey, I'm not going to end up with like my soulmate in this lifetime, but I would love to like live a life with a best friend or somebody I like or somebody who's like, we like each other enough. Let's do it. But we kind of live different lives. I think that's a possibility. I think that's very rare, but very specific. And I've seen some people do it. I think of a couple I know who reached their 70s together and they kind of settled, but they really enjoyed each other's company and they were best friends and Honestly, bro, even the way they fought was kind of funny because they fought, but they fought because they weren't soulmates. They fought because they were best friends, but they got married. They had a sexless marriage and they got together like in their 40s and stayed together for 30 years. And I think they're funny as fuck. And I really like their relationship, but they definitely were not each other's like soulmates, you know, and it was, you know, they really had a cool story together. And the way they fought wasn't like abusive or anything, but it it got toxic sometimes. But like, that's the problem is like the toxicity almost made sense because they weren't soulmates. So it kind of made it healthy. Does that make sense? I know that sounds contradictory, but even the toxicity of when they fought was it's only toxic if that's the love of your life. But because they're not the love of each other's life and they were besties who got married, they argued the way they argued because they were best friends arguing. Does that make sense? So that's the that's the situation that comes to my mind. What do you guys think about that, though? I would love to explore that with you. Does does that kind of make sense? Let's see. Healing today says, Britt, both me and my partner are autistic and girl, you and your hub sound like us 100 percent down to our first date and being ridiculously upfront and how we never shut the fuck up. I tell my partner all the time. I was like, I think we might be autists. (laughs) Not that I know that, but I was like. We might have the autism, which I think I just would make sense. But also, you know, oh, it's neurodivergent up in this. Let me tell you, we neurodivergent as hell. Oh, Nettie says, hey, Britt, just popped in to say, I appreciate you responding to criticism video. As an autistic uh, micro influencer, I am slowly learning that I need to rein back my authenticity. Appreciated your points. Love that. I know it's difficult. I am always having these conversations with myself, which, by the way, is why I know I found the love of my life because I never have to have them with him. But in my other relationships, my partners would, wouldn't understand me. They would like misunderstand me. And I'm like, why are you misunderstanding me? Like, why are you misunderstanding this conversation? My partner never. He explains my thoughts back to me so clearly. And this is what I mean to say. When I say he sees me, I mean he can explain my ideas back to me as if I'm saying them myself. Lots of people can't do this. 
Lots of people cannot regurgitate your ideas back to you in an incredibly intimate way. And the amount of detail, it feels like he takes it from my brain. Most people cannot do this. That's why there's miscommunication because they don't actually understand my perspective. They can't actually translate it. They can't get the detail of it down. He can, he does it so, I look at him sometimes, I'm like, are you in my head right now, bro? He will, he, he will say things sometimes. I'm like, that's what I said. That's what I said. And like, we'll sit there and I'm like, that's what I said, girl. That's what I said. And it feels really cool. So yeah, I don't have to mask around him, girl. I'm telling you right now, I'll mask for the bag, but I won't mask for a marriage. I will mask for the bag. I will not mask for a marriage. And I think a lot of people are asking to be to mask for their marriages, whatever that means, right? Ghosty says, feeling safe with a partner is one of the best feelings in the world, to be honest. I'm finally in a healthy or in a relationship that I feel secure and safe in. It's so beautiful. So I love that. So beautiful. Gracie says, what should you do if your partner cheated like a year ago, but you just found out recently and they seem remorseful? Can you give advice? To be honest with you, I think the best thing to do is have a professional have you guys kind of negotiated out and talk about value differences. I don't think once a cheater, always a cheater, but I do think that rebuilding on that trust is difficult. It depends on where you are in the relationship, but I, I think that's a values difference. I think it's such a strong values difference that I honestly would find it in like impossible to build the relationship up at that point. But if you want to rebuild this relationship, I would get a counselor. I would talk to a therapist just because they have the skill set, they can help you negotiate. But for Brittany personally, and I don't want you to take like what I do for my life as what you should do for yours. It would be a deal breaker at this point in my life. I'm just like, especially since they, that means they lied to you for a year. That means they kept it hidden. That means they probably gaslit you or at least convinced you nothing was going on it means that like that would be too much for me to come back from like you didn't tell me for a whole year you did it in the first place Gracie says I asked them why they didn't tell me and they told me they literally forgot I'm kind of torn since it was so long ago a year is not that long I personally could not trust somebody to do life with who cheated on me and forgot to told me like I I couldn't do what you're doing but if you know, that's up to you. I can't tell you what to do. Farah says my grandparents were like that. They bickered like besties, separate rooms and everything, but I still admired their relationship. The couple I'm thinking of, they also had separate bedrooms. They were so funny. Like they, I think it is like a certain generation of people or like, you know, I, they were so funny, dude. I can't even explain to you how funny it was. Lexi says I was in a sexless, healthy, settling relationship for four years. We were happy living together. But once I was deep in my healing journey, I realized I wanted a soulmate instead. Valid. Frame says, what if one partner fully sees the other, but that's not reciprocated? Ooh, what if one partner sees the other, but it's not reciprocated? Um, Unrequited love, right? I think unrequited love is an experience people sometimes have in a lifetime and it's usually very painful and it's usually very intense. Um, so I would take this as an opportunity to sort of learn a life lesson about symbiosis. You want a symbiotic relationship. You want to work together in that figure eight. You want to give to each other in a symbiotic way instead of Understanding that a unrequited love is a one-way thing. I see you. I love you. Why can't you give it back to me? And I think that's a good lesson from the universe to teach you more about yourself, regardless of which way it's happening. Discord says, Brittany, I don't know if you've already covered it, but what if settling, what does settling even mean to you? Well, I could, somebody has, wait, I could have, hmm, hold on, my dyslexia. Oh my, could someone said, well, somebody said, there's a grammar issue. So like, I'm just trying to understand it, I think. Even if they're the love of your life because the relationship is toxic, could that be a form of settling? Yeah, okay, I'll give it, I think I understand. Like, let's say you're in the, you're with the love of your life, like legit the love of your life. And see, how would something go wrong? Okay, my partner and I talk about hypotheticals all the time. And tell me if this is not exactly what you mean. But my partner and I are always talking about hypotheticals. Um, what if one of us gets Alzheimer's and we forget we're married and we attack the other person? Because that happens sometimes. And it's like, yeah, that's okay. You're sick. Like, I get why you're doing it. Okay, so we'll, we'll go to the hospital and we'll fix things. What if I lose my mind and I cheat on you somehow? Like, what if I get like a fucking tumor in my brain and it's like causing me to take action? Well, at that point, we might be able to negotiate something because like you didn't like it wasn't up to you. You didn't have any control. Right. 
But then what if you neglected your health and you, um, you know, on purpose got drunk every night and then put yourself in bad situations and then, oops, you cheated. Well, no, that's not okay. So the relationship got toxic. And in that case, staying with that person would be settling, even if it was the love of my life. Is that what you mean? Because I could see that scenario where if I purposely started getting drunk every night and then put myself in temptation like situations and then risk the safety and sanctity of this marriage, that would be pretty fucking toxic, right? So obviously I wouldn't do that because I'm not toxic, but okay, that could happen. And then you could end up staying in that marriage regardless because it is the love of your life. And I think you could end up settling with the love of your life. Now, with that said, when I say the love of your life, it doesn't mean like you'll fight every battle together. It usually means you'll make sure you never have to fight those battles together because you're putting the team above yourself, not at the expense of yourself. Just like with parenting, you have got to put your kid above yourself, but not at the expense of yourself. You have to prioritize your marriage and your children, but not at the expense of yourself. And then you have to decide what is the expense of myself. And that usually in a healthy relationship is in symbiosis. So neither yourself nor the marriage is at the expense of the other. They work together. The happier the marriage, the happier you are. The happier you are, the happier the marriage, right? Same with parenting, though that's a little bit more of a conflict because the kid eventually grows up and becomes their own you know, consciousness. But the idea is that when it's healthy, everything that works for you works for the marriage. You would never pick something for yourself at the expense of the, at the marriage, and I think that's what people do in unhealthy situations. They come to a fork in the road and they pick something that's for them at the expense of the relationship. Well, I really want to do this and being with you means I can't do it. Guardian says, what if you get someone who's actively growing but not there yet, but you're further ahead? So I have a threshold. Great question. I have a threshold for this. So my partner and I, it's always okay if we're doing this. But if we start doing this, uh-oh. Like, this is me and this is him. And we're like, I'm a little ahead. He's a little ahead. We're a little ahead. Oh, we're at the same. Oh, he's a little ahead. I'm a little ahead. Blah, blah, blah. But oh my God, wait. Oh, it, oh, it. Well, now what, what's happening? So the goal of a team is to make sure none of your teammates fall behind. The goal of a platoon is to make sure no soldier is left behind. You know? So if someone is being left behind, you better get your fucking shit together. And because you love this marriage and you love your life, you're going to get your shit together. You're going to figure it the fuck out. Now, that doesn't mean you won't go through hard times. It doesn't mean there won't be a struggle in the relationship. Let's say one person is having like a horrible relationship with depression and they're really going through it and it's for real, for real. They will not, at the expense of the relationship, implode everything. I've seen so many marriages that have lasted so long. And when one of the partners is in a depressive spiral, they usually still do the basics, making sure they go to work and make money, but then they come home and they can't do anything else. Making sure that if you're the stay-at-home partner, you get food on the table, but then you can't quite do anything else. And then people meet each other where they're at. Hey, because of my fibro, like this is what I can do today. And like, this is the stuff that needs to get done. That's, that's okay. Meet your partner where they're at. But never at the expense of the relationship. So sometimes you have to be an adult and do it anyways. That's kind of that part of, of the difference. It's like you got to do what you got to do to make the relationship work. And at the same time, you got to meet your partners where they're at when they're going through a rough time. And finding that balance is difficult, you know. Vibrancy says, any tips for becoming the healthy version of yourself so you stop attracting unhealthy partners? Attempting to break the cycle, but I keep falling into it. You know, in my opinion, I think it's heavily based around why. Because I think a lot of people don't know why they want to be healthy. And then I think it coincides with sort of like separating it into categories, like being a whole human being. So knowing who you are in the story, having a good relationship with your mental health, which is separate from your spiritual philosophy health, which is separate from your physical health, which is separate from your financial health. So I would ask myself, why do I even want to be healthy in the first place? It's got to be for a good, like a, when I say good, I mean real reason. And then you have to decide, okay, am I ready to change as a person? And that kind of means changing perspective. So it's really difficult to do. I do not take it for granted that I was able to change perspective. 
I do not take it for granted that I was able to go from unhealthy to healthy. I know that statistically I'm, I'm ahead. I know that that's really hard. And I know it was the hardest thing I ever did. It was the hardest thing I ever did was to break a cycle. I am not saying that this is easy and I'm not saying that it's simple. Well, it's kind of simple, but it's not simple. You know, I'm saying that you have to have a really good reason why. And for me, it was about my joy, about my deeper desire to understand my place in the universe, not just in my family, not just in my job, but like, what am I even doing alive? Why do I keep doing this thing called life? What is the reason I, I keep choosing to be alive every day? Now, a lot of people don't have that brain. Lots of people don't ever think about dying, but I thought about dying my whole life. So then I had to decide like, okay, am I done dying? Am I done wanting to die? Okay, why are we wanting though? So then I had to ask myself, well, why did I want to live? And no offense, no amount of money was ever going to be worth it. No amount of good relationships was ever going to be worth it. The reason I wanted to live could not have come from outside myself. I'm not the kind of person that like, oh, I'll give you $10 billion. Okay, what does money matter? If money is a motivation for you to stay alive, that's great. Couldn't be me. Oh, like you'll find the love of your life. Okay. So the love of my life is not the reason I'm alive. I wanted to live before I met him and I'll want to live after he dies because you know I'm going to outlive him, girl. It's just that female genetics in my family. We outlive all these men, you know. Undead Bunny says, how would you describe the difference between sacrificing something for your relationship and settling priorities? You know, um, I think uh, I saw this TikTok that said, a real man is ready to be of service and a, and, a, and, a, and a false man desired to be served. And I really vibe with that. I think, I think being of service should be the goal and wanting to be served is like a child's dream. Oh, I'm going to be a man with all these bitches and I'm on my dick stuff. And oh, my, oh, my princess, I'm going to have men serve me. A real relationship is about service, giving to one another in such a harmonious way you create a healthy relationship. Do you guys know the story? Um, I learned it through Mickey Mouse, though they tell the story many times growing up about the man and the wife where um, the wife wants to get her husband a Christmas gift, but they don't have enough money. So she cuts her hair to buy him like a bow tie or something. And then he sells his suit, I think, to get her a, a brush for her hair. And the idea is they sell the possessions that are most close to them for their partner. And their partner did the same for them. So when they exchanged the gifts at the end, it was like, look at what, like, it, it, that's the kind of like service I mean. I mean, to do something so great for your partner. And of course, that's a kid's story. I don't remember the original story, but I remember learning about it through Mickey Mouse. It's like you're, you're thinking about your partner. You're not selfishly thinking like about you. You're not just thinking about yourself. You think about your partner and yourself. You're a team. So when I think about the difference between sacrificing something for your relationship and settling, I think of the sacrifice feeling like not the sacrifice. I don't feel like I sacrifice in this marriage because everything I do for the team is the right decision. I don't think I'm settling because everything I want is everything that I have. I don't want for anything. I don't, there's no gap that needs to be filled. There's nothing in my life that I could need more. There's nothing in my relationship I could need more. The decisions we're making to be responsible adults and to save money and to invest in a house and to do all these things don't take a sacrifice when the goal is, like the goal is the dream. So, like, it's like getting in shape. I'm not sacrificing anything by working out if I want a six pack. I'm not sacrificing food, like dessert, in order to get my six pack. I just want my six pack. So like, what does it take? It's, a, it's like a mindset difference. It's like a perception difference. When I didn't want the six pack enough, like when I wanted the six pack, but didn't like want it. How do I say this? When you really desire something, when it actually is the thing that brings you joy, it doesn't feel like a sacrifice. But it's not the thing you really want, but it's the thing you think you should have. And it feels like a sacrifice. Like, I don't really want to go to college, but I'll do it for money. 
versus I love college. I love getting educated. This is my field of interest. I'm so excited. It feels like a gift. Like, oh my God, I get to go to college versus uh, I guess I'll go to college. Like, I guess I'll sacrifice these four years for a degree. If the difference is literally you. Do you even want to be there? Do you even want what you have? That's how I think about it. What about you guys? In my head, in my life, I'm in bed. My belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah, 